Good evening and welcome back. We have our last session for the day. I would like to now welcome back Bala Srinivasan. As previously mentioned, Bala is the Executive Vice President for Science and Innovation and Strategy at the University of Chicago, the Chief International Officer the and the Deputy Provost. In his role as Chief International Officer, he oversees the university centers and campuses abroad, and he strives to build academic partnerships and research collaborations that span the globe and strengthen the university's relationship to international institutions, partners, and policymakers. Bala will now moderate a panel conversation on liberal arts education in the US and India. Unfortunately, Dr. Rupamanjari Ghosh from Shiv Nadar was unable to join us due to a medical emergency, but we have Professor Partha Chatterjee, who is a Dean for International Partnerships and the head of the Economics Department at Shiv Nadar. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. Uh, welcome, Pankaj Daniel and Partho. And uh, so let me, let me just start up this conversation with some framing. Um, we talk about liberal arts all the time here in India because uh, I grew up in a generation where if you did well in school, you had to become either an engineer or uh, a doctor. And otherwise, you could, you know, you go to one of these BSc, BA programs only if you didn't get into those schools. There's still hope for that. What's the, there's, there's still hope. There's still, I rebelled against that. So there, there's still hope. Um, so things have, things have moved on. So I guess um, if you look into places like which are the engineering institutions and science institutions, IITs, ISERs, et cetera, not so much in medical school, but in IITs, ISERs, you have some requirement to take some courses in social sciences and humanities. And, um, and then the UGC has this choice-based credit system where um, places like in Stevens, it um, allows you to mix and match a few different uh, different disciplines. Um, and then you have now um, with uh, a few places um, like uh, Ahmedabad, Shiv Nadar, uh, Ashoka University, um, the first examples of uh, a more deliberate approach to our liberal arts education. And um, meanwhile, in the US, um, we've had um, the word liberal arts education mean different things in different places. There are places where there are distribution requirements, so you're supposed to take <coughs> courses in certain areas. Um, and then there are places where you can come and you have an open curriculum, you can do what you want. You know, Assume that an 18 year old knows how to structure their own education, which is a strange assumption. And, uh, and then we have, uh, we have the University of Chicago where we're pretty clear that an 18 year old has no idea how to structure their own education. <laughs> so we have a core curriculum, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, at once uh, provides a canvas, but it also creates uh, some pretty strong guidelines. Um, and, and, and then in India, we also have other, uh, other things about this word liberal arts. The word arts means something in India, and so when you put the adjective liberal to it, you, you know, people don't, people don't quite know what it means. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, let me start with Pankaj, um, uh, who is a dear friend, uh, but uh, he, I'm going to introduce him professionally. He's, uh, he's direct, he used to be director of IIM Bangalore, and now he is um, the vice chancellor of Ahmedabad University. Um, he has served as the chairperson of doctoral program at IIM Ahmedabad, um, et cetera, before that. And he was also, I think, the first dean of the ISB, right? In associate dean. Uh, associate dean uh, 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 in, uh, in Hyderabad. Um, Pankaj brings, brings that experience and, um, and has been really thoughtful and deliberate about creating this liberal arts program at Ahmedabad University. Um, so I, I just want to um, start off with Pankaj and and ask a little bit about what lessons you think you bought from from those business school type experiences, which are postgraduate experiences and uh, the undergraduate experience being quite distinct in India, and uh, and how that has led you uh, and uh, apart from that your own different thoughts now that you are at Ahmedabad to formulate your current thoughts on what a liberal education in India should be. <coughs> Thanks, Bala, for having me here. Um, you know. Um, Management schools in India, uh, unlike their counterparts globally, are, are far more eclectic and broad. And, and they focus far more on the unmanaged sectors. So it is not very unusual in a management school in India to have courses titled business government society or education policy or democracy and justice. And because for most of the students coming in there who are professional, uh, who've gone through a professional program, 
this is the first exposure to anything which is non-technical, technical or technician, I should say, you know, non-engineering, non-medicine. Um, <clears throat> so in that sense, they've always had that flavor. Um, and, 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 and if you add to it the problem-solving perspective um, um, uh, of, of a business school education, then it enhances engagement tremendously. So um, if I have to say um, the two or three things that I got out of, um, out of a management uh, program was, one, uh, the pure discipline, a graduate program in pure discipline is, is for the few and committed. Many more are looking for to collect skills, abilities, perspectives, breadth of knowledge that they, they can use to apply at many other places. So that's kind of one. Second, um, I think just thinking about issues as in, a, in a problem oriented setting um, is definitely very valuable. And third was jobs matter. Um, and and, uh, and I, I think when we started to um, start looking at what should be the nature of, um, of the university at Ahmedabad and what should its curriculum look like? Um, we, uh, we started to take lessons of this kind on one hand. <clears throat> but on the other hand, for us, there was really an opportunity to build um, a, a program, uh, especially a liberal arts program, um, really afresh and not look at programs that existed. Um, we, we decided, we enumerated list of mistakes that other programs made. So we don't want to make those. We'll make our own new mistakes as we kind of go along. <clears throat> and then we got driven by, by three big changes that seem to be happening at this particular juncture. And, and as a new institution, it allowed us an opportunity to drive it afresh. And here I must say, in, in praise of that session on early childhood education, I'm an unabashed ad admirer of school education experiments therein. And I started to learn a lot from that world. I said, is there a way I can create a Montessori <laughs> world in higher education, uh, 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 metaphorically speaking? And, and it, it, it made sense, because at one end, you had um, climate change, um, you had technology, you had urbanization completely disrupting our lives. Um, at the other end, um, you had a 17-year-old coming into a classroom who after five minutes, um, starts mind starts wandering and, there's, and every education is distant education. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and third, uh, you know, we've always talked about way of thinking and way of becoming as central to liberal education. But here is, is, is a young who is very keen to do. So this way of doing is so critical as a mechanism to learn. So when we started to put this together, we use all of these um, ideas and put our undergrad program together, which we just launched. So we don't know how it's going to come out. So we need to keep our fingers crossed. But it is very different. Uh, we have put up a foundation program, which everybody goes through. We take a 1,000 students <coughs> with majoring from music to electrical engineering. And, and the foundation program actually is not around methods. It's around, it's, it's around themes. It's thematic oriented. And we chose four themes, which are very contemporary. Um, and these are water, so in praise of water, uh, um, climate change, democracy and justice, and neighborhoods. Neighborhoods of cities and neighborhoods of countries. And we built and, 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 and designed these programs around studios, which brought in phenomenal interdisciplinarity. So rather than having a distribution requirement where the students go take courses everywhere, and you leave it to the, the student to integrate whatever has happened. We said our interdisciplinarity should mean faculty coming together and integrating it in the classroom. Um, of course, it was more challenging <laughs> to do it, <clears throat> but 
I think we've managed to, to design something very exciting. And, and, and through that, you are really bringing in skills and perspective building, areas of innovation, um, and enormous unlearning for a 17-year-old who comes from a school in India which is very, very, very focused, which is where learning is exam-driven to something which is, um, which is uh, a little bit more introspective and reflective. Excellent. And we'll get around talking about some of the details of that. Let me introduce Daniel, who, um, Daniel Dehmeyer, served as the provost of the university since uh, 2016. And before that, he was the dean of the Harris School. And so he brings that perspective. And as the dean of the Harris School, Daniel worked at the college uh, to enhance the undergraduate uh, major in public policy studies. And uh, Daniel and I work very closely together. So let me, uh, let me by way of um, introduction to Daniel, ask the following question. Um, you know, we've discussed this, the university has had a long history yeah. in liberal education, but there have been significant changes in yeah. the last 10 years. Um, tell us about those changes and, um, and how, um, how they continue to make us unique relative to our peers in the way we think about the liberal education. So I think one thing yeah. that, um, that you said at the beginning and is very important to keep in mind is that when we use the term liberal arts education, even in the United States, it means a lot of different things. And you, you mentioned you know, the model from one sense where there is a core curriculum all the way down to where, like at Brown, for example, you can design your own curriculum, and then these distribution requirements in the middle. But I think there's another piece here that's, um, uh, that's very important. Um, so you, when you go, and, and many of you, maybe some of you, but I have been there, you go to like different universities when your own kids go to college, and they'll tell you about what their, what their approach to learning is. And everybody has a liberal arts approach to, to learning. Everyone, everyone you talk to. And then you see, but then 40% of them major in engineering and they take two classes outside of engineering. Yeah. So, so in what sense is that a liberal arts education? Not, not totally clear. So I think we have to be very clear and intentional about what that means. And then that comes back to the question of how do you operationalize, how do you institutionalize it, and what's its purpose, and then how do you think about adapting or changing it? So at Chicago, again, there are very different models of that. At Chicago, the idea is basically the following, is that you can think about it as a two plus two model. In the first two years, there's a core curriculum. And in the core curriculum, our purpose is to educate our students in the way that they develop habits of mind or different points of, different points of view of how, how to think about knowledge and acquire those habits and methodologies that will serve them a lifetime. And so our core curriculum is organized by, if you will, points of view or methodologies or disciplines. So there is, there is one in humanities, there's one in social <coughs> sciences, there's in the physical sciences, and there's in the biological sciences. And I remember very well when I first had my, when I interviewed actually for my first job at Chicago, I met with the dean of the college. And the first thing John Boyer told me is like, even our music majors have to take calculus, <laughs> okay? so. And that's kind of like what the core curriculum is, is that uh, if you're interested in the sciences, you're going to be exposed to humanities, and that's what we believe in. Now, why do we believe in that? We believe in that because an undergraduate education, a college education, should be transformative. It's, you know, when you come in and you, you walk out, you should, be, you should have a different view on life, you have a different point of view, you should see the world with a different pair of eyes. And it should be broad enough that it can sustain you no matter where your particular education takes you. Then in the second phase of your undergraduate education, and because our students have now been exposed to these different areas, that's when they choose their majors. And we like to have these majors very flexible. Um, we of course have, you know, there will always be an English and history major, but we'd also like to have majors that are a little bit more adaptable. So for example, one of the things I was very interested in was developing a public policy major. And many of our students have an interest in public policy. And in neither economics nor political science, quite capture that particular interest. So there's on the one hand a commitment to a set of core concepts, and then there's a lot of flexibility once you move into the second half of your undergraduate education. So that's the, that's the model. Now how is it changing and how is it adapting? So the first obvious thing that's happening is as universities grow, there's new stuff happening. So um, we've mentioned some of these today. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, there was no molecular engineering and probably seven or eight years ago, there was no data science either. I mean, we did statistics, and we did econometrics, and we did all sorts of quantitative models, but we didn't have a word for that, big data or data science, whatever we want to think about it. And so the tree of knowledge grows. It doesn't shrink. 
And of course, we still want to have, you know, we want to have a great history department, and we want to be able all students to like history. We also now want them to take more molecular engineering and statistics and computational approaches, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one obvious aspect, which is that things have to grow. And that has interesting consequences, for example, for the size of the student body, because for, to have a viable major, you have to have a, you can't just have two kids doing that. That's not great. They have to have a community. They have to be able to talk to each other, learn from each other. So there's a natural sense of growth, and that needs to be accommodated without losing what's special about an undergraduate education. So navigating that is challenging, and, uh, but I think we, we, we feel we're good about that. A more interesting question and much more controversial question is what should be in the core. I'm just going to use one example of that. So if you think about you know, mathematical reasoning as one component of that, or rigorous reasoning in the sense of quantitative reasoning, however you want to think about it. So you know, like a thousand years ago, that meant Euclidean geometry. And then you know, post-Newton and Leibniz, yes, I'm adding Leibniz too, I'm of German origin. It meant you know, calculus. And when I, when you remember when, when Dean Boyer said, it's calculus. Because that's, of course, in the late 19th century, when many of these ideas came about, that was the language of mathematics that was, that was foundational to many areas of science. Well, then you have, with the birth of statistics and mechanics and the, the introduction of statistical methods and sociology and so forth, you get statistical models. Well, is, should we now swap that out? Calculus out, statistics in? <coughs> what about computational aspects? You can't have all of them. You can't require ge geometry and calculus and statistics and you know, some basic facility in computation. So how do we think about this? And, and these things are very become you know, immediately very controversial because if you talk to a mathematics faculty, they will say rightfully that calculus is one of the great accomplishments of humankind. How can you not have it part of the core? So what this does structurally, I think the danger is that the core becomes ossified. That it just becomes like just because 120 years ago when we put it together, uh, it was the way of thinking about it that now we're, we're, you know, how do we adapt to that? And I want to add one more piece to this, which is a challenge, and I don't think we have a, I think we feel pretty good about it at Chicago, but it's a real challenge in terms of the future of liberal arts education, I think, properly understood in the United States. So the classic model uh, in the United States higher education, not true everywhere, not true in engineering, for example, not true in other kind of professional, professional degrees or pre-professional degrees, is you take your four years liberal arts education, you sit on a tree, you read Aristotle, then you go away and work a little bit, and then you get your MBA or JD or MD, you enter a profession or you go into a PhD program, or you earn the work course directly. But many get an additional type of a degree in order to become a professional. That is not the model in Germany or France. Uh, in Germany, for example, if you go to law school at 18, you go to medical school at, at, at age 18, you go to business school at age 18. There is no this two-step process. And what we see now, I think, among our students is that, is that they are impatient. They'd like to yeah. do stuff right away. The idea that you take four years of class, then you work, then you get your JD, and then at age 28, you can finally do things is not so appealing. There may be many reasons for that. Tech industry is one, but we also see it in terms of like community engagement or startups and so forth. So there is an impatience that our students have and we have to think about what this means in the liberal arts ad curriculum. I think the way you're thinking about this in this kind of thematically organized is one way to do it. So that's, an, that's I think, is an important part. And we just have to, I think, be, we have to, on the one hand, be committed to a common <coughs> understanding for what are the fundamental habits of mind that are part of a, of a great transformative education. But we also have to be able to have some adaptability, both in terms of like, where society and the world overall is moving, and then how do we deal with the expansion of knowledge so that things do not become ossified and, and can't adapt anymore. Right. Um, thanks, and we want to come back to, uh, to a couple of those points that you made. Um, uh, let me introduce Partho Chatterjee, who is currently professor and head of the Department of Economics at Shiv Nadar University, which is um, uh, conducting its own experiment on, uh, on liberal arts education. Um, as the first head of the department, he has contributed immensely in the development of the Department of Economics there and the university overall. Um, you know, when I, uh, Partho, just to get you started off, and I uh, read about Shiv Nader's mission to develop and educate path shapers of tomorrow, 
uh, who can uh, sh shoulder the challenges of globally responsible and ethical leadership. Um, how are you thinking, you know, Shivnarad also has got the strength in engineering um, and you are in the economics department. How do you think of, of leadership that is, um, you know, subject independent and, and how liberal arts education is, is cultivating that of Shivnada? Right. Um, thanks, Bala. So let, let me again start with what Bala and you also mentioned that, you know, what is liberal arts education, right? And in India, of course, there's a huge confusion. In fact, you know, when I start talking about it, it often reminds me of a line uh, from this Sufi, Iranian Sufi Jain. The thing that we speak of cannot be found by seeking. Only <laughs> seekers get it. Okay. So, so, so really, what is liberal arts education? And um, again, we were fortunate, like the Ahmedabad University, to start with a blank slate. We had nothing. We started in 2011, <coughs> and we said, okay, that's excellent. We have no, like, a back, mm -hmm. something that we kind of inherit, and something, anything of that sort. So let's think about it. What do we want to do? And we didn't really say that, okay, we will have a liberal arts education. So we started thinking about what is it that will ensure that our students who graduate out of these programs can become leaders in their own ways, right? And can actually contribute in changing the society, changing or solving certain problems that we are facing today. And that's where we kind of, you know, come from and we built up. Because one of the things about liberal arts education in India has been that it's completely uh, separated from science in many cases. And here we do have science and engineering. So how do we integrate all of it? So that was one of the challenges that we had. We had engineering, we, had, we have science, we have engineering, we have social sciences, even business programs. So what we have done is, and again, going back to thinking about leadership in particular, but in general, what we have said that, okay, look, what we need to do is we need to figure out ways in which the students can actually become great thinkers they should have the ability to learn and unlearn, unlearn very quickly, uh, particularly living in such an age where things are changing rapidly. And how do we do that, right? So there are two basic components that we tried to play with. One is something similar to what, to what Pankaj had said and what Daniel had said, that, OK, how do we ensure that students are exposed to variety of things. Not only a, a mechanical engineering, studying mechanical engineering should not be only focused on mechanical engineering, but gets to know about history, about environment, about mm, land acquisition, and you know things like that. How do we do that? So to that element, we what we did was we structured our programs and courses in all of these programs, be it in engineering, be it in economics, in saying that, OK, uh, each student will take three different kinds of courses. One, which is dictated by the major. Because at the end of it, the student will have to have the depth in that particular major. Because you cannot go out and say, oh, no, no, no. I've done liberal arts <coughs> education. Therefore, I am not a good computer scientist. Right? So we have to ensure that. So, so that part is ensured. Then we have two other different components. One, which we call university-wide electives, we leave it up to the students. So we, it kind of goes to that model where we believe that 18-year-old can pr probably choose. But then we go back to that Chicago kind of a thing and say, no, 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 let's keep a third kind of a thing, course, which we call common core curriculum, and where we have different categories of courses, environment, technology, history, and students have to take a certain number of courses from each of these things. Right? So that was the one component. The second component, and again, we were thinking about the um, uh, education landscape, landscape in India and what's going on. And there we found, and, and uh, the, the other aspiration that we have, apart from being uh, well, quote unquote liberal arts uh, education place, is also become a, a very good research university. So that is where we thought, OK, there is some chance to bring in our research into teaching. Because what was happening in India largely is, and we have uh, this college system where undergraduate students 
are being taught by people who are not necessarily researchers. And what we felt was that this is a chance wasted. Because not only that young people are not getting exposed to research, they don't know what research is and how to go about doing it. But also, they don't see a life of a researcher. And therefore, they're not necessarily interested in becoming a researcher. And so we tried to integrate research and teaching as much as we can. So many of our undergraduate degrees are, for example, called BSc Research or BA Research. And research is not only integrated in many of these elective courses, but also that they will have to do a thesis. And why research matters is what I said earlier is about this changing world, about this learning and unlearning. So we thought long and hard about how do we go about and ensure that when this knowledge base changes, right? as you mentioned, that 10 years, 15 years back, there wasn't molecular engineering or data science and things like that. So we don't know what the 10 years later, what will be the thing to work in. Many of the professions are rapidly vanishing, and something else is coming up. We have AI in the horizon, machine learning, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of anxiety in the young people, too, by the way. So what can we do? How can we ensure that our students, when they go out, enable them, enable them to have a lifelong meaningful career and you know, satisfaction of doing what they're doing? So that's what research brings in. Because this ability to think through a problem, because what research does is not only allows you to solve a problem. Because if you learn a calculus coach, which we do to our students, that then you can, I can give, you, give them a problem, they can solve it. Yes. But how do you, first of all, frame a problem? Yes. How do you understand? So everyone can say, oh, global warming is a problem. But that's not good enough, right? That can't lead to a solution. So how do you come from that point to a point where you, be, you talk about a tangible problem that can be solved, a feasible thing that can be worked on, right? So, so that is a training that we are trying to bring in into our education very much. And hopefully, going forward, some of these students will pick up on those and become leaders in their own ways and you know, solve some of these critical problems over time. Great. So let me, let me start a discussion based on something that Daniel spoke about which is, um, you know, when we put people through a liberal arts education, we're dealing with, with kids who are very impatient. They, they want to figure out how they're going to get through it and going to get a great job. So there are impatient, <coughs> impatient kids and, as you mentioned, high anxiety kids. And this is a problem not only in, in India but all over the world. In India, you have to sell a liberal arts education to these kids who are watching their, their colleagues from school go to the IITs proceeding in apparent straight lines towards great jobs, and, and what about them? And in the, in the US, this kind of immediacy and adjacency of jobs has become so pervasive, it's creating anxiety with kids, but also anxious parents. Yeah, more so. And you have to sell the liberal arts to the parents as well. So how does that work in India? Yeah. And, and then we, we have Daniel speak a little bit about how we're dealing with you know, the, the changing nature of, um, you know, we spoke about early childhood, late childhood that's happening in the U.S. <laughs> with, with, with these kids still being kids when they're coming to college. Um, you want to talk a little bit about, about jobs? So, um, I think the, the big challenge are parents <laughs> for yeah. us. I mean, convincing in India much of the decision making is, um, is done very closely with parents and, and I think uh, it's been quite a task for us to engage with parents um, and be able to explain to them um, what this methodology, this way of thinking um, will lead their kids to become. I, I think it's this pathway. You have to sell that. Uh, you have to sell that and you have to actually show it to them. Um, the challenge from the, the students is slightly different. They see their um, counterparts in other engineering school, for instance, and they come back and tell me, well, you know what? Your 30 to 40% of your curriculum is not in engineering. I'm actually going to learn much less of computer science than what my kid, what my friend in other school is doing. And you have to actually explain how this is going to help them 
learn better, how it is going to help them think a little bit deeper, how it's going to help them apply better, how it's going to, more importantly, um, get them to ask the right kind of questions. So I think it's that framework within which you, you, you work with, these, uh, with the students. Um, now, the question is, I mean, in the engineers in, in this country are less of a problem on the jobs, etc. cetera, yeah. um, and they'll, they find their way. The challenge comes when somebody's coming out with a wanting to do a bachelor's in history um, or, or philosophy and say, now what? What am I going to do? And, and especially this in, in India. And, and not many of them would want to go and do a PhD. Um, and I think that's really where um, much of this broad and deep education um, comes in very handy. Yeah. And we, if you pack them um, simultaneously with skills. So to give you an example, um, uh, the new math, for instance, at, at for us, Everybody learns data science. Again, irrespective. But the data science that people learn is layered at different levels. Mm -hmm. So some learn to use um, organizing of data and GIS maps very well and data visualization. And that attracts them and makes them that much more skilled to be able to do. Others um, learn another language to do archival methods yeah. better. And that provides them with additional skills that are needed to, um, to find the kind of opportunity in this new kind of job that seems to be emerging. So I think those are ways in which at least one progresses to help. You're talking, about, you're talking about skilling. How, how do you skill? How, how, do you, how do you balance the skill with the, I mean, skill is not learning alone, right? No. You, how do you balance skill with, with deep reflection, learning of, 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 of of the discipline yeah. and, and this breadth together. That's right. Chicago, we actually think a lot about these careers coming out of these majors. Maybe Daniel, you can speak yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll I think this is a very, very <coughs> interesting and, and, and important question. And so there is, I think that the, the, the promise of liberal arts education has traditionally been to say, well, um, what we do is we provide you with the habits of mind that will serve your lifetime. And so um, I've, I had discussions with like provosts of you know, fellow universities that would say, you know, well, it doesn't really matter if you graduate from us what your major is. And moreover, um, the skills that get you a job, they, they lose value very quickly. And the other skills that make you a leader, they come in later, so yeah. to speak. So uh, you get a job because you're a great Excel pro I've used the business school analogy. You get a job because you're really great in doing Excel programming. That gets you the analyst job, but then once you have to lead a team, things like organization behavior, how to manage people become much more sure. important. So, so that's an interesting tension because, of course, you know, parents and students as well, but parents in particular, are very concerned about making sure that this, their, their kids are employable. But then there's the sense, well, they're employable, but then down the line, right, it's where these, what, they, what people in this, in this world call soft skills, that's kind of not a great, uh, yeah, it's a great term, but habits of mind that allow you to structure complex uh, situations in an effective way to deal with people, uh, to think about how do, you, how do you develop leadership capabilities. That's where, of course, these, these issues and these um, capabilities become much more important. So that's the tension, I think, between these two, these two aspects. So how do you solve that tension? So in a, in a variety, I think there are a couple of different ways in which how you do this. So the first thing I think, you know, Parthar's point on research universities is really important. And, uh, it's, it, it's in the, this is again a US specific observation, but I think it has some lessons for India as well. There are two types of liberal arts education in the United States. There's one of them which are embedded in large research universities, like the University of Chicago, like Harvard, like Columbia and so forth. And then of course you have the pure liberal arts colleges, which are four year institutions um, without any of the graduate schools or the graduate programs around mm -hmm. that. The liberal arts colleges are under severe stress right now. Mm -hmm. And so, the value proposition that they've had to people that you go there, you learn the habits of mind, and then you do that thing, it, that's not working so well. On the other hand, liberal arts education inside a big research, research university is booming. So every one of, we and every one of our peers yeah. get increasing students that are moving into this direction. So I think what we're realizing, and it's just kind of 
we want to be we are more intentional about this now is how do we take advantage of exactly the way you described it is that there's that it's not just about transmitting knowledge and about you know teaching it is about our students being able to formulate problems okay. of their own, to think about how to structure, unstructured environment in a way that they can make a contribution, which is what research is fundamentally, okay. but it's not just about solving problems that are given to you. So, but that means now from, a, from the point of the university, we need to be more intentional about providing research opportunities for our students from day one, immediately while they're there. And one way we have done this and institutionalized this is now every part of the university, including the law school, including the policy school, including the divinity school, including the business school, is either offering a major or a minor for mm -hmm. our students. So that those students that want to do research in that particular area have an ability to do that. And, uh, and we think that's one particular step. Another step that we've seen, very interesting, is, uh, the, is the double major phenomenon or the major minor phenomenon. So many of our students, a very typical thing for University of Chicago students, is to be double majoring in economics and history, or mathematics and art history. Very common. And, uh, or they come with an interest in an art, performing art, visual art, and so forth. And so often this is a kind of compromise within the family. Is that, yes, I'm an economics <coughs> major, but I'm still really interested in history. And, uh, but what that means, of course, is that when the way we structure our majors and our minors, it's got to be compatible with that. Sometimes it's simple things like scheduling that need to be adjusted. But we see more and more of our students that do that. And I, and I think that's a very helpful development yeah. because it, it, it instantiates in the way they de deal with their entire education, how they, how they define themselves as having that part that they're interested in that part of their interest and it allows them to deepen both of these interests. Yeah, yeah I think that that's a very good point. So yeah. the, the, the thing about a liberal arts education in, in the University of Chicago, you mentioned about this curve which makes that edu education useful later on. You're basically saying to the kid or the parent, don't worry. Don't worry. Your yes. kid won't get the, a better first job, but they get a better third job. Yes. So that can be. <laughs> that's a hard <laughs> argument that's to make. Hard, yeah. That's yeah. a hard <laughs> argument to make. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if it happens for a while, it happens. Yes. Then they're like, yes. yeah, and therefore we should give your kid the better first job as well because he's going to get the better third yes. job. Yes. How, how do you how do you de how do you deal with that when it's the yeah. first time and you have to convince yeah. someone? Correct. No, that is a challenge always, right? To yeah. particularly with parents. I mean, my experience, and I'm speaking for. Mm -hmm. Many of my colleagues who have spoken to both students and parents, sometimes it's much easier to talk to a student because mm -hmm. that student yeah. probably has a you know, <coughs> view Fashion. of a much longer period, that's what I feel, than the parent. The parent is looking at a much shorter horizon and therefore the first job is so much more important. Yeah. Right? Whereas a student it's probably the does these game, <laughs> game theoretic calculations and <laughs> projects forward. So that's the some, something that you know I think we'll constantly have to talk to parents. We do try to do that. We try to educate parents a lot. We have a lot of interactions, a lot of conversations with parents. But also now, now that we are about seven, eight years old, we are actually getting our students doing a lot of our jobs, our students who have passed out. Because as I said, I mean, one of the things, even in the first job, what they're saying is, look, we are doing so much better because we are able to ask questions. In India, that is a big deal because asking right questions for a project, for a team meeting, et cetera, that doesn't happen at all. People are often very focused on doing a job that's assigned rather than trying to say, oh, how can I add value to this project even if I am like at the bottom of the ladder, right? Yeah. And that word, if, so that is one thing, if that message, if we can, and I don't know exactly how we can do that, but that is the message that we are trying to, and we are trying to you know, educate the parents and trying to uh, put it on all our literature, et cetera, so that, look, it doesn't matter where your son or daughter lands up in the first job, but they are going to do very well in their career right. in their life. Yeah. So let me switch gears a little bit. We've spoken about jobs is the exit part of it, but what about the entry part of it? So admissions into liberal arts schools. And here again, I think we in the US and we in India face two different challenges. 
you right now don't have a huge pool of people who are clamoring to come. Um, liberal arts schools are sometimes more expensive than, than engineering and medical schools. How, how are you <coughs> going to evolve your admissions process? And in the US, we have a, we have a problem where we have um, an overabundance of applicants in, in a certain category of liberal arts schools. And, we, and you know, the, the university, for instance, recently made SAT testing optional. Um, so we, we also have our own particular way of figuring out who is the right cohort to come and study together to shape the liberal arts education for each other. Um, how do you think of, um, especially Pankaj yeah. and Partho, about how you, how you admit and curate these first few important classes of your liberal arts um, cohorts? So, um, um, yeah, I, our, our number of applicants are not that large at this particular juncture. Yeah. Um, but what, so what we've done is um, we, um, we meet every student who applies to us. Applicant? Every applicant. And, and we have a few thousand um, applicants into the program. And we have a, we have a large team um, that meets every student, uh, every applicant. <coughs> and, uh, and, and through that process, we're actually able to, um, to the three or four things that we, we want to do. First and foremost, um, we want to be a very diverse school. And uh, one that is, um, um, and which is quite challenging in many other new private institutions, but we want to bring both socioeconomic, regional diversity. So we try to, um, we're trying to make that as a, as, as a central focus. Second is, um, we're constantly looking for um, young people who are, um, who have a strong desire to learn. I mean, it's a, I'm, I'm, um, how do you figure it out? But because in this kind of an environment where you're doing things in the country for the first time, you need a set of people in your early classes which are, who are very engaged, who actually believe that this is for them. Um, and the third thing that we also um, uh, we do is we're keeping in mind we, at Ahmedabad, we want to be an institution of second chances. Um, so unlike, um, unlike uh, um, uh, a one-time admission process for many institutions in the country, um, you have a class 12 grade, which is 99%, and you make it, and someone else who's not there doesn't make it. Um, we're looking at, at the entire application and multiple years of outcomes and inputs and what they've done to be able to see, is there something in this process that allows me to say, well, you know, there's a dip somewhere in here. There's a dip here. But this, this kid really stands out. Um, and that's where we've, we're spending a lot of energy into making of the class. Um, again, these are, as I said earlier, these are early days. And I'm sure we'll probably we'll land at some equilibrium on all of these methods. And plus, of course, you want to make sure that the kids um, does well academically yeah. and, and, and builds initiative, yeah. um, uh, takes initiatives uh, in there. And so those are the kind of things that we keep in mind. But there's a lot of energy going into, uh, into deciding who comes in. At some point, the number of applicants will become so big, this will become impractical. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very true. Yeah, and you know, Gan, maybe you can say, I mean, we have, what, 30,000 applicants, and you know. You, you can speak plus. plus. Plus, yeah. So that challenge in terms of how yeah. how how we are dealing with it, you know, and, and reading the, reading those essays, and with that trying to make up our minds. So we have a different set of challenges, and um, so we have a a, a class of uh, seven thousand. Our um, so our rate of admission is around a little over seven percent. So we have a we have a lot of applicants. A lot of students want to come to University of Chicago, and. Um, and uh, so what are the, what are the types of, of challenge that we have? So I first, I, I 
we, we, we spend a lot of time and effort on that. We have an absolutely tremendous um, uh, admissions office, dean of admissions and advancement, who are just doing a spectacular job on that. But what is their job? Their job is um, to make sure that the students that we have, that's the students who come to the University of Chicago that benefit particular from the University of Chicago education. And the University of Chicago education is not for everyone, and some benefit more than others. The way we, l it's not too dissimilar. Sure. We're looking for students that have a lively mind. Mm -hmm. And our admissions process is designed for that. So uh, we have you know, quirky essay questions and things like that so that students can, can demonstrate to us that they would benefit from the University of Chicago education. And we went SAT optional as a, uh, as a consequence of that because we felt that we had our, the, the, the test scores were so high that they were not discriminatory at all and we didn't learn anything from that, but, but test scores also correlate with socioeconomic backgrounds. So we were actually you know, creating barriers for part of, the, of our student body that, were, were, that we wanted to remove. So it's very important to us that we, have, that we do everything possible to increase access for our students. So that means that our, our commitment is that you can come to the University of Chicago irrespective of your financial or other background if this is the right school for you. What was, this has, what was very interesting <coughs> about this has been the journey to get there. So the first thing that we did was to, uh, to go to neat blind admissions, which basically means that uh, you get big, you get admitted irrespective of the financial condition of your parents, and then you basically pay as much as you can afford. So these two processes are separate. That means, for example, if, you ma if your family makes less than $75,000, you pay nothing. If your family income is less than $125,000, uh, you, you pay no tuition. So that's, that's practically what this means, which, which you know, still is not able to accommodate all financial need, but it does it, to a, it, does it in, a, in, a, in a pretty dramatic and widespread fashion. What we learned, however, is that that's not enough. And so in addition to having financial barriers, there are what I would call non-financial barriers or social barriers. So we learned, for example, and this is very, very group specific, that there are specific boundaries and challenges. An example I was mentioned today, once mentioned earlier. If you are come from a, from a very underprivileged background, let's say you come from an inner city community where violence is part of your daily existence, and you, have, you, you, you go come home from school and you ask yourself, you're 15, whether your brother has been shot today or not. That is a very different environment than you come from a wealthy middle class suburb where your parents were investing in your, in your enrichment activity on a day to day basis. There's also a concern whether you even consider, imagine yourself at the University of Chicago. So one of the most, the most heartbreaking um, statistics and data that we know of is that many students that would be, at, would be admitted at a highly selective university and would, be, would have a free ride actually go to their local university because they do not imagine themselves fitting into an Ivy League or University of Chicago type environment. So that means now you have to reach out to them and their families to be able so that they can imagine themselves, or for the families, their sons and daughters at the University of Chicago. Two examples, one with Hispanic students. Hispanic students, we had, we had difficult time five years ago, six years ago, to attract Hispanic students to the University of Chicago, in part because Hispanic families, Chicago has a large community, but then other parts of the country, and Hispanic, in Hispanic families, the families, the parents are very involved in where, their, where their, their sons and daughters, their kids go to university. So we had to not only convince the students, but the parents. So the way to do this was to bring the students and their parents on campus during junior year, and then have all the admissions materials translated in Spanish, into Spanish, not for the kids, but for the parents, so that they could imagine themselves and their family and their children for this to be an appropriate destination. We're now doing the same thing with rural students. More than 70% of all high school students are in rural communities. They do not have the typical enrichment activities that we usually, that a standard admissions process requires. There may be a small school, there may be a school that has never sent a student to a highly selective university. How do we connect with them? So when we think about diversity, we call it diversity of diversity. Diversity of different perspectives on that. And every group where we can see obstacles to access, we intentionally try to remove them. Some are financial, some are cultural, some just have to do with like, you know, what are the, what are the opportunities for the students available in their environment, and we try to adjust for that. 
So it's an ongoing process, yeah. but yeah. it's all yeah. driven by the vision is that we want to be able to bring those students to the University of Chicago for whom the University of Chicago is the right place, irrespective of their background or financial or family situation. It's a totally different perspective. Um, maybe we can open it up for any questions that people might have. Yeah. Gary. <coughs> Danny and Louis and, and Deepesh, so one after the other. Yes, the, um, the two plus two model of a liberal arts uh, BA program presupposes a four-year uh, BA degree. And as I recall, uh, even though Shivnader University, for example, might have wanted a blank slate, they had to confront uh, an insistence from the government that the BA would remain a, th a three-year program. And I'd just like to hear how that confrontation played out and what the current situation is. OK, so yes, we did have a lot of regulatory back and forth. But what we do is we follow this thing called choice-based credit system, which means that our programs are not designed in terms of number of years, but in terms of credits. credits. And our students are allowed to graduate after spending minimum of three years and a maximum of six years. And typically, they spend about four years within the program. But so it's not a four-year system. No. It's not a four-year system. Confused. No, no four years. It's three to six. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, uh, the motive just, for? Uh, to yeah. add to that, exactly there's a new the education <laughs> policy that has been circulated. And the government is uh, going to adopt that very soon, probably in the next parliament session, which actually advocates four-year undergraduate programs. So uh, in all it's likelihood, really we might be moving, <laughs> India might be moving to a four-year yeah. undergraduate system. In that, in that note, the government notes that four is a number that might be between three and six. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they will confirm shortly. <laughs> Deepesh. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all for a very instructive discussion. Uh, my question is really to Daniel from our shared experience, but it might have a larger application. So the overall discussion you had as panelists, and that completely makes sense, is basically of an input-output analysis type. You know, you get in students, how do you churn them out skilled for the world that they're going to encounter? And the three of us are actually in the belly of the beast uh, with the classroom experience. And because my own personal journey has been from physics, business school to history. Uh, I had to think, for, and Chicago is the place which taught me about the significance of humanities and what is it that we do in the humanities, not just liberal arts education, which is both useful but not useful in the way that, let's say, Michael Greenstone's work is useful. Yes. Uh, and here is what I have learned from my life experience, that human beings encounter two kinds of problems. One set are the solvable problems. So when I was in my business school in Calcutta, and I am, I am Calcutta, the, the, the operative phrase everywhere was develop a problem-solving attitude. And then we encounter problems that are negotiable, but not solvable. And this, I, under this I encounter, I think of things like encountering power in the world, distribution of power. Somebody who is more powerful than you are and will act accordingly. Encountering hierarchy, encountering your own sexuality, and other people's sexuality. You can't escape these things. And young people in industrial societies precisely are in that sort of age group, falling in love or falling out of love. Uh, aging, going through your own kind of adolescence to post-adolescence. And what I find is that I, have, I don't know any educated person who, in negotiating these problems, have not been influenced by literature, by their exposure to films, to plays, to, so that's where I think the strength of the humanities is. You know, it's not giving you a particular set of skills with, I mean, we do all of those things. I mean, and as you know, our humanities is changing. We're including video games, Patrick Jagoda's work, and all of that sort of stuff. It's wonderful. But at the end of the day, I feel, like, what am I doing in the belly of the beast? I'm actually teaching, whether they're reading the Odyssey, or the Ramayana, or the Mahabharata, every narrative is about these deeply profound human experiences of what I call negotiable, but not solvable problems. And sometimes in overemphasizing impact, 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 we forget that this, this other kind of deep impact that the humanities actually have, which is, as you get educated, giving you a kind of, it doesn't produce a unified solution. No, there's no one solution. 
and you appreciate that there's no one solution, but it gives you multiple experiences of how humans, since the beginning of Homo sapiens, have had to cope with these problems. Uh, so that's why this one, it's a report from the belly of the beast. Uh, yes, submission, uh, really. So very well said. Uh, I, think this is, I think this very well said. This very is well beautifully said. put, the, yeah. way you, the way you describe it. And I, th you know, I always, when people ask me, I always, it's like, it's a, it's a way to explore what it means to be human uh, in a whole variety of different dimensions. That's as important as solving it, yeah. it is pollution as, the It is problem. as important, as crucial as, as anything else that we teach. So when, 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 when I'm going to use a word that, that, that you're going to object to, but just for, I use it for a pun, okay? It's for a pun. <laughs> So um, when people ask me, you know, what's the most useful thing you've ever, ever learned, I said when I was a philosophy major, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and, and it had exactly, and of course, you know, it had, had exactly that experience of to engage with profound deep questions for whom there is no, there is no answer. But, you're, but you explore more, I think, you know, the typical way is you understand why certain answers are not answers and you get into this kind of you know, hermeneutic cycle where you get deeper understanding, but you never get to a solution. Sure. And that's the, that's th that is a very profound experience, and I think that it's absolutely essential uh, for, for our students to have that. That's why we would do it. That's and, why we do all it. All I want to say is that Chicago has taught me that. That's great. My 25 years uh, in Chicago, I love that's what it's taught me. For somebody who, growing up in India, didn't know the difference between social science and humanities. Yes. Going to an institution where, they, where it's institutionalized into a humanities division and a social science division. And when I taught, when I taught the Communist Manifesto, both the social science text and the humanities text, in social science, the uh, question was, what is the argument of Marx and Engels about social change? In humanities, the question was, what is the genre called manifesto? When did it begin? And it really gave me a profound understanding of what distinguishes social science from humanities and what makes both important but different. So I would, I would say, I think this is, this is a wonderful way I think you described this, and I think that we, we have tried at, at Chicago to hold on to that vision and to, and to really, really be committed to that. Uh, I'd say there are two failure modes for the humanities. And one failure mode is to instrumentalize humanities. And, uh, and that's, why I, that's why the whole concept of soft skills makes me a little nervous because it goes to that direction. The most extreme version of that is you hear this sometimes when people try to make an argument for why humanity is important is people say, well, human I hire humanities majors because they make the better coders. Mm -hmm. And that's why you want to, that's why you really be, a, be an art historian because you're really a better coder down the line, you know? And that's the instrumentalization. I think the other danger is the, is the over-politization of the humanities, totally where it basically that. becomes, you know, it, it, it conceptualizes as some form of the social sciences. And those are the two things I think, the way you describe it, I think, is beautiful. And uh, it's certainly the concept of humanities that I think we at the University of Chicago are, are very much committed to. Just to add um, one thing, so I completely agree with you. And the fact that, you know, what you pointed out, that there are different experiences or different ways of looking at it from humanities and social sciences, very important to understand. And also what you mentioned, that, you know, that kind of learning and that kind of going through that gives us a better way to deal with today's uncertainty in a major way. And that is something that we have to appreciate. And that, I think, is one of the messages about liberal arts education that we have to you know, give out. So, yeah. Louis, sir. Uh, this is a question for both Pankaj and uh, Partha. Mm -hmm. You talked about two great experiences at Ahmedabad University and at Shivnadar. And uh, it really is aspirational. I'd like to know what your student experiences have been over there in terms of both the faculty who teach and secondly, the infrastructure. Are they o underwhelmed? Are they overwhelmed? I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Uh, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, let me talk about the faculty. Um, you, we've done um, things a little bit differently because we're wanting to create um, a different kind of an environment from what already exists in many of our institutions in the country. So we decided to work and bring in young faculty. So about 75 to 80% of my faculty are, are young faculty, fresh PhDs. And, um, and it has had, I mean, it has both an advantage and a disadvantage. The disadvantage, of course, is, you know, you have fresh PhDs very deep in their own field across different disciplines. Um, 
who now have to adjust and think about creating something new. The advantage is this is an opportunity to create and design a new bubble which brings in really an integrative experience across humanities, social sciences, sciences, and the professions. And, um, and so we've done two things. One is, and of course, this set of senior faculty, who, few of them who will mentor, and many who come from outside. But what we've had to do is to be able to um, um, get in people who are predisposed to this kind of thinking. So we very clearly go and say, well, you know what? If you really want to do just what you've done at your PhD, then we are actually the wrong institution for you. Um, and that gives us a little bit more space to now engage with the faculty and the faculty to engage with this new environment. And the second is, we've actually, we work a lot with faculty across these um, um, mechanisms to create um, dialogues across disciplines. Um, and, and both formally, informally, um, through speakers from outside, through research projects being done along with students. And all of them are actually leading us to um, uh, look at the integration, in my mind, um, of the methods and the themes, and not keeping them out separately. So that's the one, one part of it. Um, infrastructure. Um, has not been that much of a challenge. I, for me, I feel if you get the right set of people, you know, you can sit outside under the tree and still be able to do a phenomenal class and, 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 and get the most out of it. Um, and so we are in the, in the process of building up of our infrastructure, but it's probably um, uh, decent enough to house everybody, both in terms of laboratory spaces, reading spaces, uh, living spaces, um, coming together to um, be able to create an environment where you're constantly thinking about learning and its and, and reflection. So uh, some of few of those things um, we've, we've been putting together in place. But it's a, again, uh, as I said earlier, um, these are things that need, at some point of time, will all come together to make it happen. Martha? Yeah, so our, I mean, uh, first let me talk about how we get faculty, and then I'll talk about a little bit about their experience, and uh, then student experience. So our approach in getting faculty has been somewhat different in, uh, than what Pankaj had just described, in the sense that we do not really try to screen people about whether they're predisposed to think in the same lines as we are thinking or not, right? Primarily because I don't know how to do that. Maybe <laughs> I need to come no, down with the I mean, music okay. sometime later. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't no, mean that, but no, no. Um, yeah. so 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 that is that, and also because uh, and you know in some ways that relates to what we've been talking about. Our whole university is also rooted in the disciplinary ways and methods and things like that. So it's not devoid of that, right? I mean, we do not want the disciplines to disappear and like in several places you'll have a old social science department we do not have something like that right we have a sociology department we have an economics department and how can we actually achieve excellence in each of these departments and computer science department a business school you have to actually get the best people in there right best people in terms of what they have been doing in asking questions in that particular area and so so we have had challenges, because particularly f faculty members who have been trained in India, let's face it, if you have been trained in IIT, if you have gone and done an undergraduate in an IIT and eventually done, did a PhD maybe at IIC or IIT, you wouldn't have interacted with people of variety of types in a, in a very meaningful way to, for a large number of these people, right? So now, that's what's happening in a campus. So many of our faculty members stay on campus. All students stay on campus. And of course, we have a continued dialogue. So it's, in some sense, for many of us, it's a continuous dialogue with a lot of people about what we are doing, what we are trying to do. For example, these common curriculum courses. Why do we need that? I mean, not 
only parents, sometimes even that question comes up from the faculty members who have never actually encountered anything in their education earlier, that why do we need such courses? So, so that's a process that is continuing and that will continue and you know, that's the kind of environment that we have. And in terms of um, infrastructure, we've been very lucky to have Mr. Shiv Nader as a philanthropist who has supported us. So we have, you know, we have invested a huge amount of money in science labs. So people who have visited from across the world have been very <coughs> impressed. Obviously students who are actually doing these programs and all, they get to train in the like state of art thing. So that is a very different kind of experience than that any undergraduate student will have in India at any you know, university, I would say. So, so infrastructure-wise, that's that. So, so for the students, again, I mean, this experience that one, that you can possibly take courses across the university, right? Um, economic students takes a dance course, right? Uh, at the same time, a computer science course, a maths course. So, so that kind of experience is something that is new, and they wouldn't have even kind of had a conversation about that with some someone, their senior brothers or predecessors and things like that. So that is an experience, and students really like that, right? I mean, th that is something that I have figured out that this is, and this may not be very mm, known to them, but once you expose them to this kind of a thing, it's very, very popular. So students, when they go out, actually, you know, become advocates for these kind of, uh, this, this program. So that's something that, yeah. yeah. Um, we've had time for one quick last question before we would wrap it up. Uh, well, you know, I, uh, I have a small comment. Uh, uh, you know, while I found uh, all these discussions extremely refreshing and useful, uh, you know, when one looks at the theme in terms of comparing American and Indian liberal education, uh, the panel is still, from the Indian point of view, is very microscopic and small in the sense that you have a huge number of public universities and state universities where liberal education are offered, and Sibnadar and Ahmedabad are exceptions and still very new from that point of view. So, so I'm, my comment is from the point of view of this large body of institutions that have emerged in India and the sort of education that has been imparted over there and uh, what are the consequences and what is it that we can think about. <coughs> so in American universities, uh, one of the things in some American universities, there is always this concern that engineering students should also study American government and politics and all of that stuff because you want to produce a good citizen. And I haven't come across in India ever any professor uh, in any university that I'm familiar with where our purpose is to build a good citizen. Uh, that's never, uh, you know, ever uh, came out in any discussions that I have come across in our country. So I found it quite strange. For instance, IITs, which is probably one of the best institutions that we built, undergraduate institutions in this country, we have a social science section which is very tiny. And that social science section never taught democracy or politics or constitution. They have sociology, they have psychology, they have English, and uh, no, no history. I don't know any department of IITs of India. Social science division has got historians uh, in the part of it. Uh, our government built up a university called South Asian Universities, which is a very prestigious university. And one of the purposes is to uh, you know, promote uh, all this stuff. And one of the things that we can sell in this country is our democracy to our neighborhood, which is, uh, despite all of its limitations, a good thing. But we don't have Department of Politics or Democracy in that uh, university. So uh, I was just wondering, like, you know, how to address all of these concerns about it. You know, just think about it. Thank you. All right. We'll take that as a comment. And thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Um, to Pankaj, Daniel, and Partho. And I think we now go to unveiling the Rajasaurus. Is that we, have, uh, we have comments. Cool. Dipesh. Oh, 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 sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, of course. Dipesh is going to wrap up the whole thing. Yeah. No, 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 please come here, Dipesh. <laughs> Thank you. No, I mean, just, just a very few brief comments. We yeah. are all eager to have the unveiling and the reception. Um, so standing here and being, uh, being, having been here all day, uh, uh, thinking that this is the fifth birthday of the center, my mind naturally goes back to 
longer than five years uh, when this whole effort started. So it really goes back to nine or ten years. Um, when Gary and I and David Green um, began to work on it, and it began with a phone call from Tom Rosenbaum, who was then the provost, he called me in and just said um, about chairing this committee. And, and you know, I'm not a, by nature a committee person, so I said, what's the brief? <laughs> and he said, look, all that he said, he said, look, India and China are interesting social experiments. And as a university, we want to engage these places. That was, that was it. He didn't say anything more. And fortunately, Beijing had already started. So there was a model to think through. And we, we, we realized that we are, we are not going to set up campuses. We are not going to go in for joint degrees. That was the vision then. So the center emerged as what we could do. And really, today's discussions were a wonderful demonstration, uh, given EPIC, given TCD, you know, how it has uh, expanded, uh, grown, and the wonderful connections we have formed with Indian government, with Indian bureaucracy, with Indian institutions, NGOs. Uh, everything was on display today. And, uh, and you know, before we came, we had a, a, Gary and I got an email from David Green, who is now the president of Colby College, wishing us, uh, really congratulating us. But that email told me how much how, much, how many emotions were invested in those years of building this? Uh, so that David remembered with fondness uh, those years when we were working at the center. Um, look, it's a, it's a wonderful day. Uh, uh, this center has become what it is thanks to the very hard work that the staff of this center, you know, the leadership, global office in Chicago and the Ballas leadership have put in. This, I understand, is Daniel's first ever trip to oh, India? Second. Second. OK, but we hope that you keep coming oh. back <laughs> and, and be involved with the center. And, uh, and uh, so uh, the last thing I have to do before uh, closing and before inviting you all to go and watch the unveiling and, and, and attend the reception is to thank all these people who have made the center possible, whose work has made this day possible, and whose attendance has actually made this day so meaningful. So thank you all very, very much. And thank you. Thank you.